What's the best thing about being part of Vegan Business Tribe? Oh my gosh, I'd say the people and honestly you, you've been such a great resource. Like not, I paid you to like, say that. <laughs> I was going to say you didn't pay me to say that, but truly your support has been a change for my business and I know that I wouldn't be in the place that I am today if it hadn't been for your advice. Join Vegan Business Tribe because you guys have been absolutely amazing. A lot of the reason why I'm, I, I've done well on social media is because of the people I've met people have met through you guys on the way you're brilliant i can't ever thank you enough david the community and people like yourself was always with guidance there's always somebody to hold your hand there's always somebody to provide give you encouragement i really like the fact that you can informally just ask someone for advice and everyone will just jump in there to help so there's been times where i've been like from a vegan perspective i need some guidance with xyz so i just pop the question into the group and they'll straight away i'll get a response within the next few minutes I absolutely love being part of Vegan Business Tribe. I love the resources. I particularly love the business clinics. You know, people can come in with a particular problem and then we bounce our ideas. Um, and, and that's been really, really useful. Oh, I love being part of Vegan Business Tribe. It's the community. It comes down to the community. So always having someone there to ask questions or share ideas with everybody is just really friendly and kind and everybody wants to help everybody which is which is nice like i think there are very few kind of industries where helping each other is more important than competition and you really don't have this kind of sense of competition in vegan business tribe it's very much everybody has the same goal and we're all doing this together and we want to help each other vegan business tribe for us has been an absolute rock over the last four years we've been members in terms of advice we value it very highly episode 123 of the Vegan Business Tribe podcast with myself, David Pennell. And Vegan Business Tribe is here to support you and to inspire you, not just to build a vegan business, but to build a successful vegan business. And you can listen along on Spotify, Apple, or wherever you get your podcasts. Or you can also watch the video version on YouTube too. And thank you as always to our absolutely amazing sponsors who are Vegan Accountants, Mindful Wealth, The Vegan Publisher and Mad or Make a Difference Promotions. And those voices that you heard at the start of this episode, they were just some of our Vegan Business Tribe members telling me what they thought the best thing was about being part of Vegan Business Tribe. So... If you are a regular podcast listener and you feel that you get value out of our free content, but you're not yet a member of Vegan Business Tribe, I'm talking to you, then stop what you are doing and head to our website right now at veganbusinesstribe.com. Because not only will you find all the help, the community and the support that you need with your vegan business, your membership, it will mean that we can keep doing everything that we do to support and champion vegan businesses around the world too. Now, today we've got a super special episode. And I know, I know, I say that every episode. But today, we really have, because we are going to the core of what it means to have a vegan business. And in a moment, I'm going to be joined by the original vegan business guru, Katrina Fox, who is my fellow resident business expert at Vegan Business Tribe, to discuss our new Vegan Business Tribe series that Katrina has just produced for us about using your business as your vegan activism. And in this series, Katrina, she's interviewed six of the biggest names in the vegan business scene at the moment about how they use their business platforms and the skills that they developed over their careers to move the vegan and the animal rights causes forwards. And this is a brand new series that you can stream exclusively 
exclusively in our Vegan Business Academy on the Vegan Business Tribe website. And if you're looking for inspiration and motivation to really make a difference with your business, then you don't want to miss all six episodes with some of our sector's brightest business stars. And I also want to just give a call out to Jim Moore from Bloody Vegans Productions, who was also our editor on this project, making sure that all the recordings went smoothly and the quality of the final product is as high as it can possibly be. So on today's podcast, Katrina joins me to talk about the six entrepreneurs that she interviewed for this series. And it ranges from vegan tech entrepreneurs to champion bodybuilders to online vegan stores who've got million dollar turnovers and even a vegan Willy Wonka with his own vegan chocolate factory. So you don't want to miss any of that. And Katrina and I, we also talk about our own takeaways from these interviews, including the crucial things that Katrina learnt as well from interviewing these amazing vegan entrepreneurs that you can adopt into your own business too. So let's jump in. But as always, if you want full access to this new series, then if you are already a Vegan Business Tribe member, all you've got to do is log in to our Vegan Business Academy and you will find all the episodes ready to stream there, just like Netflix. But if you're not yet a member, then we're also offering a free month's access to Vegan Business Tribe so that you can watch the full series, so we can get it out there to as many people as possible, alongside hundreds of hours of masterclasses, online courses and guides, that make up part of our members' permanent collection too. And if you're listening to this in the future and you missed out on that free trial offer or you've just got a question about joining us at Vegan Business Tribe, then email me directly on hello at veganbusinesstribe.com and I'll just see if I can sort you out. Okay, so let's go into my chat with Katrina Fox. I am with Katrina Fox, our resident vegan business expert at Vegan Business Tribe. And we're talking today to introduce this new series that Katrina's just recorded and produced for us on the theme of using your business as activism. And in this series, Katrina, you've just interviewed six of the most probably high profile vegan founders of the moment to fully understand what it means to run a vegan business and how you can use the business skills that you have to help move the vegan cause forwards. And I wanted to catch up with you now, now that you've done all the interviews, just to run through the people that you talk to and kind of get your thoughts on each interview. And I'm going to jump straight in and we're going to start with Matthew Glover, the founder of Veganuary, Veg Capital, VFC, Vegan Fried Chicken. So just tell me a little bit about Matthew and his vegan business journey. Well, Matthew's had a very interesting vegan business or business journey per se, because he actually started out as a um, a, a window sales, like I think like double glazing type sales window. And he was an, actually an influencer in that space, which I thought was quite funny. Uh, and of course, you know, he's gone on to, as you said, you know, become the founder of Veganuary, which is a global phenomenon and has also started VFC and they bought other brands. And he's now uh, starting the what we the kind of vegan version of Unilever, which he sort of teased a little bit in our our interview but hadn't quite launched it yet so that's what the exciting announcement is and has really used all of his skills as a a business owner as uh, his skills in corporate and also new things you know starting a a non-profit like Veganuary for example starting the uh, Veg Capital I think it's called where you're you know which is like an investment a venture capital fund and I think that's really interesting and inspiring what I liked about Matthew's interview though is he does give us all a real dose of reality because I think if I'd interviewed Matthew two, you know, three, four years ago, some of his answers might have been a bit different. But in the, you know, in the, in the past sort of 10 years since what, what we call peak vegan, when mainstream media and everybody was all over veganism, we have seen many shifts and changes. And he, he, he gives us quite a, a dose of reality in terms of if you are interested in, in setting up a, a vegan business. 
But he also touched on the importance of collaboration and consolidation and the fact that we haven't been prepared for this big backlash by animal agriculture with their misinformation, their disinformation campaigns. They've got the trillions of dollars to put out there to get mainstream media coverage, proclaiming the death of veganism. And I know you covered that in one of your podcast episodes. So there's a lot to do. And when Matthew, as Matthew said, we we hadn't really seen that coming. And I like that he's pushing for the fact that we all in the vegan and the plant-based space need to come together and collaborate and be more unified so that we have a chance to for more vegan businesses to succeed, or at least for veganism to succeed, maybe with businesses being more consolidated. So yeah, so I think definitely a dose of reality uh, from Matthew and some honesty, which I think is really important for people watching. Watching this. And what I really liked about that interview, so I've I've kind of got to know Matthew over the last few years. You know, we, we're quite often at the same events and, and we've had a number of discussions. And, you know, if you look at somebody like him with what he's done for the sector and what he's done for veganism, you've already said it, you know, he started Veganuary, one of the world's biggest vegan movements. He then went on to make investment companies, food companies, things like this. But when I was talking to him um, a, a couple of months ago at events, he just really thinks that we've still got such a long way to go. And I don't think maybe, you know, even someone like Matthew can can fully appreciate the impact that he's had on the sector. Well, that's it. I think sometimes you can't see kind of what's going on when you're inside the tin, so to speak. Like you, we sort of see things in our little vegan bubble or in our vacuums and, and you just never know. Uh, and sometimes I guess it's just a sort of human thing that we, we can't quite see. Like you said, the impact that we've had. I mean, you know, I'm sure you have people coming up to you saying wonderful things about how vegan business tribes help them. You know, I've had people all the time, saying, oh, Katrina, I, read your all book the time. Be- I read your book, <laughs> Vegan Ventures, and it channel. I'm like, oh, lovely. And you just, you don't really think about it and um so yeah i think we've certainly we've got a long way to go we've got but lots but in a good way uh, there's lot one of the things i loved about the whole interview series was there's so many creative ways to start and run a vegan business and to do activism with it so i do think that is is really exciting so yes we've hit a few speed bumps in a way it's kind of good though because you know, I've been vegan nearly 30 years now. And back in the day, animal agriculture, big, you know, all these you know, big meat companies, etc. cetera, none of, them, none of them cared at all about us. We were so not important. We weren't even a blip on their radar. The fact that they are, you know, having to kind of feel like they, they, they've got to shut us down or they, it means they're finding it a threat. So in a way, it's a good thing, but we haven't been prepared for it, which I think is another thing that, that Matthew said. And I think we need to have we, we need to learn from what's happened over the past few years and to be a bit more prepared and to be creative and work together. Do you want to speak at more events? Do you want to get invited onto podcasts like this one? Well, it's far easier to do that if you can say that you have written a book. So let me tell you about The Vegan Publisher. Their founder, Matali, she is a best-selling business author herself. And Matali and her team, they will lead you through that entire process of becoming a published author, transforming you into the thought leader of your industry. And writing a book, it isn't just a great marketing activity to get you more clients. Trust me, being a published author, it will open up doors to opportunities that you never even knew existed. So even if you think you don't have the time to write a book, or even if you don't know what you might write a book about, go take a look at theveganpublisher.com to find out more. If you are a UK vegan business, wouldn't it be better to have an accountant that shares your ethics? Well, vegan accountants have got over 30 years of experience and they're a vegan founded company. And just to add, they're also our accountants at Vegan Business Tribe because they just get us. They understand why we do what we do and they make sure that we're doing it in the most tax efficient way possible. Keith and his team, they've been massive supporters of our mission at Vegan Business Tribe. So if you are an established UK business with a growth mindset and you want an accountant that is going to help you grow and shares your mission as well as saves you tax, then just go to veganaccountants.co.uk. 
www.thepodcast.co.uk to find out more. Absolutely. So on to, uh, I think, one of my favourite interviews from the series was Nigel Wright Brown from the Black Veg Society. And she also runs a celebrated vegan restaurant, uh, Land of Cush, in Baltimore as well. And, and just what an amazing background she had before she got involved in that vegan movement. Definitely. And I think that's what's really inspiring for anyone who's listening or watching to this and who is wanting to start a vegan business and thinking, well, what, what can I do? Everything that you've done to that point, and this is what Nigel says as well, everything you've done to that point is really going is going to be helpful for whatever you choose. So as you mentioned, Nigel is what we call a multi-hyphenate, which means she does lots of different things. So she's had, yeah, huge um, corporate kind of background. Uh, I think her last corporate role was quality assurance with Verizon. And one of the things she said is that regardless of whether she's working with billionaires or with a, a person who just doesn't know how to use their phone properly is how you react to them is really important. It's that attention to detail, helping them, building that relationship. And it's all about your personal brand. I think she said you are a brand. And I think that was a really important point. And you take that throughout your career from, from whether you start out, you know, in whatever job. She also produced comedy and, and events and, uh, and stuff. So she's had quite a variety of backgrounds, but every little thing has helped. But all that kind of continues through your life and your your personal brand is really important and I think that's really important particularly for vegan business owners and founders and uh, yeah Nigel uh, fascinating as you mentioned the land of Kush is an award-winning vegan soul food restaurant in Baltimore Maryland and then they also started a non-profit uh, which is the non uh, the black veg society is the non-profit arm of the land of Kush so she said some really interesting things there which I think people are going a lot going to get a lot of value um, out of as to well uh, why why couldn't you just do things just with the business? It's like, no, there are maybe some good reasons for starting a non-profit arm that's linked to your business. And uh, yeah, Nigel's great. She's got a talk show. Nigel speaks on YouTube. She organises, co-organises the Vegan Soul Fest Festival, which attracts tens of thousands of people from interstate as well as internationally. Uh, she's now doing a children's veg fest. So she's got her fingers in lots of pies. So I think anyone as well who's who's a bit like that and that doesn't just want to do one thing. You know, you've got to have some other things on the go. Um, she's really inspiring for that and offers some tips and advice on how to be able to juggle all of that. So, yeah, she's wonderful. I love Nigel. I've known Nigel for a good few years now and uh, she's amazing. I'm so glad we got to chat with her. So am I as well, because I, I think in veganism, we don't talk about cultural heritage so much and, and, and maybe race and veganism as well, because, you know, people do look at the vegan movement and they might see a lot of white faces within that. But if you are an African-American, you are more likely to be vegan than if you are white. And, and I think that's a conversation that we've not had enough. Absolutely. And I love that she she touched on that in that the name of the restaurant, the land of Kush, it's edu part of that is educating people about our African ancestry and about the foods that we we, that they were eating um, were a lot of that was was plant based and yes there is this assumption that veganism is all about uh, you know white trendy middle class kind of hippie sort of um, phenomenon and, and of course it's not I mean yes it's the philosophical aspect and the, but there's also the aspect of plant based eating and plant based eating for health and I think one of the things as well with Niger is and I think that's the same with with uh, a couple of our other um, interviewees like Vicas is they've come from corporate backgrounds but the business that they've started is actually very different. So neither Nigel or her partner Greg knew nothing, didn't know, hadn't run any, hadn't run their own business, hadn't, uh, didn't know much about how to make food. But Greg uh, self-taught how to cook. Nigel learned how to run a business, throw, you know, got in her marketing skills, and they've made a success of it. So I think that's a, an important point that you don't necessarily have to be working in the field. Yes, it can help. Uh, like Jeff Palmer, for example, worked in the supplements industry and then started his own business within a particular niche. But you don't have to. You can actually retrain. We've seen a lot of people leave corporate and become vegan lifestyle coaches, which is totally different from what they were doing. So you can retrain. But as we said before, everything that you're bringing, all those other skills, whether they, you know, they're people skills, communication skills, leadership skills, you bring that with you to your new business. So I think that's, that's really important um as well but yeah absolutely really important to to cast our um 
our perceptions a lot wider. And there's, you know, amazing people doing brilliant work in, in that space as Tracy McQuirter. And Nigel is one of the leading lights in that. She's a big, big collaborator. She collaborates within the vegan space, outside of the, the vegan space, doing amazing things around, yeah, veganism and, and race as well, which is really important. So you just mentioned uh, Vicast there as well, Vicast Garg, who's founder of the vegan review platform and app A Billion. And, and again, that's somebody who's, you know, had a very different background, but they've been able to bring some of that skills to actually build something which has really grown amazingly quickly. Definitely. I mean, he came from a, like a serious, you know, well, I say serious corporate investment <laughs> banking type background. And uh, he wanted to create, the, he wanted to have their entrepreneurial spirit. And he created an app. And it, I remember when it first started a bill and it started out as a, an, a review app where you could go to a vegan restaurant or you go to a restaurant and have a vegan dish. And then you review it, and you post it to the platform. And then a dollar is donated to a charity of your choice. And then since then, it's grown, it's become even bigger. And now, I think it's I can't remember the figures, but he's raised a ton of money for for charity like to to vegan and animal or, and other organizations through the app. And it's a really interesting model. And um yeah, it's just a very, very interesting model. And what I, I liked what he said about he came from an investment banking background. He wanted to create an app. And so he went on a coding boot camp. Now, he didn't code the whole thing. He hired developers because it's highly technical. But he went on that coding boot camp to have an idea and an understanding about what was involved so he could speak the language and li liaise with the developers. So I thought that was a really good tip as well for people that, yes, even if, you, if you're going to go into something different, maybe shadow somebody or, you know, find out as much as you can about that world. Um, and a bit has gone from strength to strength and they're now offering i believe uh, you can buy have uh, have shares in the company so not an ipo but instead of your dollar going to a charity you can choose or, or to yourself you can choose to have uh, stock in the company so he's got a really interesting model and i'm um, and very unique as well uh, so i'm really excited to see where that goes and he shares some yeah excellent advice on his entrepreneurial journey and creating something quite unique I think it's two million dollars that they've um, already given to good causes, yeah. which that, it's you know, amazing. Th th that kind of level for for you know what they've created that that is absolutely amazing. But I, I just want to just again pick up on that point of the idea that you know. Um, it, it, he didn't directly use his background as an investment banker to, to make a product. He used that background to actually get the money in, to raise the money, to, to get funding and things like that. And I, I've met so many people who do have a corporate background and, and they're, they're thinking, well, what vegan business can I run? And they end up, you know, making cupcakes or something. And it's kind of like, you know, to, to, you, you've got to bring together the, the skills you have and that career capital with something that, that you um, are going to launch next. So that whole idea that he didn't code it himself, he didn't build it himself, he just went and learned how that whole industry works so he could bring his skill set, which is raising money, managerial, into making something which has had an absolutely massive impact already. Yeah, um, absolutely. So I think that's that's a great, it's a great way to be inspired. And like you said, with that, so with getting the investors, the fact that he was in investment banking, yes, he probably had networks. He also had that credibility. So I think it's important for people to look at the things in their own life and look at the skills, look at your own network. Um, I know a lot of entrepreneurs who have gone from corporate to starting their own business and some of their supporters have been their previous employers because it's that personal brand. You know, they know, like and trust you. And even though you might be doing something different they may well support you whether that's financially or by making introductions and again that comes back to what Nigel said about your personal brand following you through your career um, so yeah yeah really interesting now, the next person I want to go into is uh, Adrian Ling, who is the CEO of, of Plamel. And now you, you christened him as the vegan Willy Wonka. And, and that's kind of stuck. I loved it. I, I've, I've known Adrian for a long time and I interviewed him for Forbes a few years ago and I nicknamed, nicknamed him the vegan Willy Wonka because he literally has a chocolate factory. He literally has he, a chocolate he's got, factory. He's got the hat. <laughs> he's a very colourful character. And I love it. And what I love about Plamel, it's the longest running UK and possibly even European vegan company. They've been going since the 60s. Now, Adrian's, I've got to mention Adrian's father, Arthur Ling. He was vegan back in 1927. Um, and he was part of the cohort that, along with Donald Watson, that uh, were part of the vegan society that coined the name 
the term vegan. And I met Arthur in 1996 at Conway Hall in London at a London vegan festival where there was a few hundred of us crammed in to this uh, festival. And I was desperate to find chocolate that I liked because I'd just become vegan and I loved my galaxy creamy chocolate. And I remember finding one that Plamel did. And I got to meet Arthur and shake his hand and say, thank you so much for having an alternative. So it made it easier for me even back then to actually have a a, a chocolate alternative. Um, So I love Adrian and what what I really like about there's so many things like about Adrian but what I like about Adrian is he's an absolute vegan advocate he's a vegan business owner but he also gets himself out there out of the vegan bubble into the world of confectionery he's constantly on panels and speaking and and in that world and also constantly innovating. So coming back to what Matthew was saying about how much we need to do, um, and perhaps we weren't prepared for certain things. One of the things I think that Plamel has, has been very smart about, and particularly with Adrian, because he trained as a chemical engineer, but he'd worked in Plamel since he was a kid. And he joined the company in 1980 and decided to just work with them. He said to me, his father was a visionary and a pioneer, but not a businessman. So, but what I think Adrian has brought to the company is real that real kind of sense of, of business. And um, so, you know, they've got the the chocolate factory where they do contract manufacturing. They make other brands vegan chocolate that is technically, quote, a competitor. So it's that diversification of income. And Adrian can, and they've been innovative. So Adrian saw what was coming. Um, he knew that veganism would start, would have its day, would start to become a bit more mainstream. And they prepared, they foresaw that and they prepared for it. And I think most recently he teases in the interview a new product that the company's brought out and it's a coffee snack product. So they're constantly innovating. They, they're a product company. So they make things like, you know, chocolate and they've had other products over the years and some of they've kept some of they've changed they've done rebranding of certain things so they're constantly tweaking pivoting obviously you can't um you know uh predict things like world you know wars or brexit or you know things like covid but you can you can try and control the things you can predict and try and pivot as much as possible and have that diversification of income and get out of your vegan bubble. I mean, obviously, you know, yes, join Vegan Business Tribe and be part of that and a network, but it's also important for us to go out into the, the general world or within your industry to, and, and you're advocating for veganism, even if you're not necessarily talking about it. You know, the fact that the, the Plamel products are vegan, they go after other markets like the allergy free market. And that's what's helped to keep them in business since the 1960s. So definitely must listen to that. I mean, listen to all of them. But yeah, Adrian is one of my favourites. He's amazing. Well, just picking up on that last point, I think it is unusual for a company like Plamel to be multi-generational. You know, usually the founders, they, they sell or they step back once they reach that certain level of success. And we've seen that with uh, um, Naked Bars, you know, this with Andy Shovel and places like that. So it is quite unusual that, um, you know, starting with his father, Arthur, that this is still that multi-generational vegan company. Well, I think that comes down to what kind of business do you want to have? And we've seen a lot at the moment about food tech and, you know, big companies and scaling and getting millions and and doing all of that. That's one way to do it, but it's not the only way. And, you you know, you could be a vegan solopreneur because, remember, we've got vegan service providers who are running their businesses. So you could be a solopreneur at home in your home office working online right through to the big multinational global you know huge kind of companies and then you've got everything in between you've got a local restaurant or you've got something like Plamel now look I'm from the UK but I'm based in Australia I'd love to see Plamel in our supermarkets and on the shelves but I'm not going to and that's okay because they are thriving and they're doing what they need to do in the area that they do it and that's okay I think sometimes we can get a bit carried away with reading about these big success stories but you might just want a business that's a lifestyle business that will support you and your family give people work in the area and and, and do good in the local area so there's many different ways of running your business and I think that as you say that's a really nice example of uh, a family business and he even said I think he says in the interview with the employees I think they've got about I don't want to say the number, I might get it wrong, but maybe 40, 50, maybe more employees. And a lot of them have been with the the company for years, for decades, some of them, which I think says a lot to almost bringing that family, that sense of family and that sense of family culture to the workplace, which you don't necessarily get when you kind of become multinational and, and global. So, yeah, yeah, really interesting model. 
I'm sure that Adrian would talk to you about being the Australian franchisee for Plamel. <laughs> I'm sure you'll have a conversation. <laughs> uh, just moving on then. So, 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 so the next person you interviewed, uh, again, fascinating conversation with Annick Island, who is the co-founder of Immaculate Vegan. And, and this is an online vegan store that's turning over more than a million pounds worth of sales a year. What I really like about Anique and Immaculate Vegan is it's an interesting model because there's no warehouse, there's no shop front, it's an online store and the model they use is drop shipping. So they handle everything, the customer service and the sales through their website, but they're fulfilled by the brands. Um, and I think that's a really interesting model because obviously it keeps overheads down. But what's also interesting is that Anique said they're not yet profitable. So they've raised quite a lot of money. Their sales have gone up, but they're close to, they're very close to turning a profit. So that's something to be aware of as well, is that, you know, if you're going to do a particular business, how soon are you going to get to profit? And if you're not going to get to profit quickly, how are you going to fund yourself to be able to do that and I think the Immaculate Vegan have navigated that really well mm. one of the smart ways they did that was Anique partnered with Simon Bell who is an e-commerce specialist and a vegan so and whereas Anique started that out and this is a nice bit of information started out as a blog an Instagram blog and has now grown into this uh, online fashion store I think they're adding homewares and stuff now and what they do as well is they bring other vegan brands they showcase other vegan brands they carefully select them they're in the more premium um category and so that's a nice bit of collaboration you know they're 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 bringing other vegan brands together on this one platform this one kind of online marketplace that that people can buy from so very interesting model interesting about the partnership choosing the right partner to work with in your business and uh fundray you know they've done well with both invest raising money from investors but also crowdfunding because people obviously believe in it and it's carefully curated and i liked some of the things that anique said which i which you can find out when you watch the interview about the many different ways as with all of our interviewees that they infuse different forms of activism and obviously with Anique's company the name vegan is in there whereas with others the name isn't in there so it's quite interesting I think people are going to love how people are doing their various types of activism whether that's vegan activism or other types of activism as well which is great. I think even though, you know, the name vegan is in there, that um, immaculate vegan platform name, um, Anique, she did talk about the idea of subversive activism. You know, the fact that many of the products on the site, that they are vegan, is it, it, maybe secondary to some of the people who are buying them. They're just focused on really good quality products. Exactly. And also sustainability, I know, is very uh, key as well. So, yeah, exactly. So people are looking for, like you say, something stylish that's going to last long, great quality, is sustainable. And then it's like, oh, and it happens to be vegan as well. How how great is that? So, yeah, yeah, she's got some smart tactics, which you'll find out when you watch it about, yeah, doing that kind of subversive um, as well as um, more obvious forms of, of activism, which is great. I just wanted to break off for a second to ask, are you just following this podcast without being a member of Vegan Business Tribe? Because if you are, then let me tell you, you are missing out on about 80% of everything that goes on at Vegan Business Tribe, including incredible resources and a vibrant community of like-minded vegan business owners from around the world. Because as a member of Vegan Business Tribe, you'll gain access to hundreds of hours of online courses and guides and masterclasses in our Vegan Business Academy to help you grow your vegan business. You'll also get to attend our regular online networking meetups where you can promote your business and just forge those connections with fellow vegan business owners just like you. Plus, if you need more direct advice and assistance, you can join us on a live business clinic or you can post a question in our community hub where all our other members plus our vegan business experts are waiting to help you out. And the best part, it's just £18.99 a month. And at the same time, you'll also be supporting the work that we do champion the vegan business scene around the world and just to add that we've now also recently introduced one-to-one -one business coaching and mentoring with myself or one of our vegan business experts and that's available to a select number of our members so if you're really looking to take your vegan business to the next level then we've got you 
don't just lurk on the sidelines. There is a whole community of vegan businesses who want to get to know you and support you. Just head to veganbusinesstribe.com. Click on that big join button on the homepage and I cannot wait to connect with you and discuss your vegan business or your next big idea. Absolutely amazing. So let's let's wrap up this uh, conversation about uh, the people you interviewed, talk about Jeff Palmer. And I absolutely love Jeff Palmer, who is the CEO of uh, uh, Clean Machine, uh, Vegan Nutrition. And we know that veganism has a masculinity problem. And I think, you know, studies show that as many of, possibly 80% of vegans are female. So, you know, having someone like Jeff championship bodybuilder in his 60s that is a completely different kind of activism to everybody else who we interviewed absolutely um i mean yes as you mentioned the whole kind of you know male female split i mean carol adams has been writing about that with the sexual politics of meat and the whole idea of particularly you know how masculinity is linked to to meat and yet jeff just blasts all that nonsense stereotypes out of the water he's been vegan for 40 years uh, he's in his 60s, so he's in the older demographic. He's bodybuilder. He's super fit. But what, uh, so yes, he breaks all those stereotypes. So that alone is is activism in, in and of itself. You know, he's a role model and influencer. What I like about Jeff as well is he now he came from the supplements industry, so he worked for years in the supplements industry, and he said I think it's very competitive and quite a cutthroat industry. But what he did instead of going right, I'm going to start this you know huge massive. Uh, uh, a supplement vegan supplements company that's going to go against all these like big players he didn't he was like right i'm going to very carefully choose certain products and look some of his products i think they some of them are unisex but i think his niche is like he has specific products for men and particularly for men who want to bodybuild he's carved out an, a special niche within this broader industry and is nailing it uh, in in that field and he remember what I said about you know if you're going to do something like immerse yourself in it he immerses himself in the information he is constantly on social media he's, he's always got a research study to back up everything that he talks about so what I liked about Jeff and I'm not going to tell his story because he tells it is and I didn't know this about him again he's someone I've known and seen you know online for, for a long time is his personal story of how he became vegan uh, it was like, wow. Um, and it, yeah, it, it, you just kind of never know with people when what's going to tip them over the edge. So I think people are going to really enjoy Jeff's personal story of how he yeah got into veganism. And uh, yeah, some really helpful tips about growing, growing a business in a very uh, competitive market, I think is going to be really helpful for people. I think it's interesting also when you've got somebody who is that dedicated to veganism, you know, when he was talking about the importance of, of keeping his core vegan message at the forefront of his business decisions, sometimes actually the cost of, of making more money as well. Well, that's it. I mean, that, and that's what you've got to kind of decide, you know, are you going to be a sort of business at, at all costs kind of company um, or... Yeah, what what do you do? It's about your values and about saying, no, I'm not going to do that or I'm not prepared to that. And some people might take it differently. So you might, you know, you've got companies like Impossible Foods who obviously want to make a global impact. And obviously they've been a bit controversial in the vegan scene because they tested their product on rats who died. Um, but they obviously thought, right, yeah, we want to have this bigger impact. So we can justify that. And then you've got someone like Jeff that's like, yeah, I could make, I could go big or I could make a lot more money, but actually, no, these are my values. This is what I'm prepared to do. And I know we saw a discussion, I think, on Vegan Business Tribe in the community about uh, Amazon. You know, do we buy from Amazon? Should we list our products on Amazon? So it's all about, you know, we've obviously each got our own set of values and lines that we will or won't cross. And Jeff has decided to go his particular route where he's got a successful business and he's not prepared to do certain things to make even more money. Absolutely. So, Katrina, six really in-depth interviews with six absolutely amazing, you know, vegan business activists. What I really want to know is what did you learn from those six interviews? So, so what are you going to take away and maybe implement in your own business or something that you're going to put into your toolkit now about using your veganism as activism? I'd just like to know your, your kind of big takeaways from this series. I think one of the ones is 
the creativity that's involved now in different types of vegan businesses. We're seeing so many different vegan businesses in areas we wouldn't have dreamed about. Like when I say when I first went vegan 30 years ago, it was mainly what am I going to wear, uh, you know, shoe wise, particularly and um, what am I going to eat? <laughs> Whereas and I was happy with, you know, once I found my plamel, my particular because there were different plamel chocolates, but I particularly like this one. I was happy with that. That that was it. I finally found my vegan cheese from the Redwood Cheese Company, which became V Bites that Heather Mills bought. I was happy with that. That was my one thing. And I think now it's just fascinating to see. Like there's a vegan soul food restaurant. How exciting is that? So I love the uh, the the creativity. Um, I think the dedication that everybody shows. And I think what I really liked, and I think this came across with everyone, I, I know I particularly talked to Niger about it, about the way you approach people is, yes, you can take a stand when, you, you know, if you want to talk about injustice or share something about fat farm, absolutely. But when you're dealing with people one-on-one, -on -one, one of the tenets of the Black Veg Society is meet people where they're at. And I really liked that kind of inclusive type of activism that all of the interviewees do, even if they feel very strongly. And Adrian, I know, is quite outspoken and, you know, we all can be on, you know, some issues, but you can still be inclusive and, you know, go into those other markets, go, as I said, go out of our vegan bubble into and meet people and invite them into veganism so that it's something that they're attracted to and that they want to be part of, they want to try, because we've got a lot of stereotypes to overcome around. People are telling themselves stories in their head about veganism, about vegans and about vegan products. I've heard stories of stallholders at markets trying to get free something, you know, as people are walking past them, would you like some free vegan chocolate? And they go, oh, I'm not vegan. Like they, they think you've got to be vegan to taste just the free chocolate. So I think we've got a lot of stereotypes to overcome, a lot of negative stories to overcome. And what I loved about all of our interviewees is that they really take that inclusive and positive stance to invite people in to showcase their beacons of veganism in a positive way. Um, so that was one of my big takeaways. I think the second one was probably resilience. You know, all of them we've spoken to have been in business, some longer than others, but uh, that just that sense of resilience, because we've seen so much change, even just the past three or four years, we've seen, we've had so much upheaval in the world and divisiveness and things that we just couldn't have predicted. And so, yeah, seeing how people have navigated that, I think that's been, uh, yeah, really excited and maybe given me perhaps a renewed sense of excitement about the, the world and veganism and vegan businesses, because obviously, you know, we've seen a lot of vegan businesses closing and not just vegan business obviously others have as well and i just love the fact that the we've got these people here showing that you can run a successful thriving vegan business yes you're going to have challenges but doing it and doing it in a way that is inviting to people that's my key takeaway which i loved Absolutely brilliant. And just to pick up on that first point that you made, I mean, we often say at Vegan Business Tribe, if you've got a vegan business, but you only look to sell to or engage with vegans, then you're kind of missing the point of having a vegan business in the first place. You know, the whole idea that we have vegan businesses is to move that vegan course forward. So so it, it, it's wonderful that that came up in, you know, quite a few of the interviews as well. And I think a, a, another really important point for me, which, which I took watching back those interviews, was this whole idea of kind of embodying the values of veganism, you know, personally and professionally, so many of the people that you interviewed, their kind of vegan business was so tied up with their personal story. You know, uh, listening to so many of those interviews, when people spoke about, you know, why they went vegan and why they then set up a business on the back of that, that really resonated with me as a business owner. And I'm sure it's going to resonate with customers as well. So I wonder if you if you could just tell me a little bit more about that idea of storytelling, because I know this is something that you're, you're really good at yourself. And it, it, it's something that you've really honed in over this last couple of years. Yeah, definitely. I'd sort of taken a little bit of a step back from just the kind of general vegan business world and started collaborating with you. Um, but what I've really been, yeah, fascinated with is this idea of story. It's like, how can we, because it's, I think in the age of divisiveness, it's how can we connect with people? How, 
and uh, because otherwise you've got lots of facts going on. So we've got, like we said, the misinformation from big animal ag. They're saying one thing. Vegans are saying, no, that's not true. This is what it is. And the general public just don't know. They're like, well, this person says this or this organisation says this. I don't know what to believe. And I think what is really useful is that stories cut through that logic. Yes, you need your facts and figures, of course. But when you couch them in a story, it's very different. I'll give you a brief example. So I'm part of a storytelling programme and the mentor who I work with, um, like he's former US fighter pilot, like someone completely absent. I talk about getting out of summer vegan bubble, but I was just very drawn to him and the way he works. And I ended up being a on a, a live call, like you get live calls as part of this. And I ended up in the room. There were only like literally there was me, the storytelling mentor, and two other people. One of one of them used to work in a meat packing process a while ago the other one was a hunter like literally that was his like main hobby he was part of hunting forums and all of this and I thought oh that's the universe at play so I asked the storytelling mentor I said look if um you know it it, with storytelling like could I use a story to convert this guy and could he do the same with me or is that a bridge too far and the mentor said well he said it probably is a bridge too far, but what you can do is you can use a personal story. For example, I, I could talk about why I became vegan, uh, why I became a vegan. And when the person is listening to a story, particularly a personal story, they have to assume that it's true, like because they have no evidence otherwise. So, you know, it's not like a fact or, you know, a report that's come out with statistics. It's a personal story of mine. So they kind of have to listen to it and assume it's true in order to make sense of it. And what that does is it just kind of, it bypasses that rational mind or the stories they're telling themselves in the mind that, oh, vegans are this or vegans are that. It's like this they're hearing this one personal story. And what he said, the hunter might kind of say, OK, look, I don't necessarily agree with Katrina, but I can see, I can understand why, you know, from her experiences, why she chose to become vegan. And by vice versa, you know, I might vehemently disagree with this guy who's into hunting, but he could potentially tell me a story. And I might think, oh, I don't agree with it, you know, because I'm obviously thinking about the animal but I can kind of see why he may have chosen that path. And what that does is it just breaks down those barriers. Instead of people being at each other, it just kind of allows for that little bit of connection to then maybe take the conversation a bit further. Um, And we've seen, you know, there are people, I've, I've known former hunters who have turned vegan. We've got people like Howard Lyman, former beef dairy farmer turned vegan. There was a, a pig farmer in the UK. So you never know when someone is going to shift their position. But if they're being ranted at or, you know, they've constantly got vegans just having a go at them, they're probably not. It's about, again, comes back to that inviting. And I think stories really help to invite people into your world. So I think founders definitely need to tell more personal stories. But we also, I think as a movement, need to change the narrative around veganism because it's gone back to, oh, veganism is dead. Veganism is, you know, past food is ultra pro all of that stuff that's coming out in the mainstream media we need to change the broader narrative and we do that by sharing those individual stories whether that's a personal story for you as a founder which i think is really important for founders to do not hide behind your brand um and also through whether it might be staff stories customer stories so and it's storytelling in a different way so as a journalist i've you know worked in journalism for 25 20 plus years and it's a different way of telling stories. So I'm having to reskill. Talk about, remember, I said about upskilling and reskilling. Even I'm doing, having to do that because, yes, I can tell stories in a certain way as a journalist, but telling stories in a way to connect with others is actually quite different. It uses certain structures that our brains are actually used to and they know, ah, oh, this is a story and we relax and let it in. So I think that's super important and I'm excited to bring that to the vegan and plant-based space. That's a really good activism tool as well. And when we talk to vegan business tribe members who are maybe struggling to get that penetration, that's something I always go back to, you know, have you got a story that you can get across? Because I think when you talk to somebody just about your business and especially you talk about journalism and PR. If you go to a news um, platform and start talking about your business, it's an advertisement. But if you start talking about yourself and why you started that business and the mission that you're on, that's when it becomes a story and that's when more people will pick you up. So, uh, yeah, uh, yeah. 
absolutely brilliant thing to pick up. If you are looking to get your business in the news or on the radio or interviewed on TV, then no one's going to get your company noticed like Karen Ridges and her team at Mad Promotions. And Karen, she's been at the forefront of the vegan media scene for the last 20 years. And Mad Promotions, they're also our media partners at Vegan Business Tribe. So if you've read about us in plant-based news or in Veg Economist, then that's probably because Karen got that story there. So if you are an ethical company or entrepreneur that wants more media coverage, and if you're a company that is looking to make a difference, then that's literally what Mad Promotion stands for. Karen, she's worked with the January VegFest and all the other big names. So go find out more at Mad hyphenpromotions.com Did you know that in the UK alone there is currently around £3 trillion invested in pensions and much of that money it's helping to fund harmful industries like tobacco, fossil fuels, gambling and animal agriculture. So if instead you want to put your money where your heart is, then Jay Street is the founder of Mindful Wealth, our UK-based independent and vegan financial advisor here at Vegan Business Drive. And because they are truly independent, they're not restricted to any specific investment range, so they can find the best option that works for you both financially and ethically. Although do note that the value of your investments, it can go down as well as up. But you don't need to have a lot of money invested to make a difference. If you want to talk about your financial planning, whether you're just starting your journey or you need a little guidance on how to create and maintain good habits, then book a free discovery call with Jay by heading to Mindful Wealth. UK. The, the final thing that I think I picked up as well um, was a few people said this who, who you interviewed was this theme that if you are going to create a vegan product, then that product just being vegan kind of isn't enough. It's got to be high quality. It's got to be ethical. You know, this isn't the 80s or 90s anymore in terms of vegan products. You know, consumers expect it to not have to be a downgrade from what they've bought before. Oh, totally. And there's a couple of things that that spring to mind is, where was I? I was somewhere recently. Oh, no, that's right. I won't say who it was, but somebody had given me some free products to try, uh, food products. And one of them, like, if you looked at the uh, non-vegan version, like it had meat in it, like animal-based meat, but this vegan version didn't have anything. Like it didn't have tofu or tempeh or any plant-based meat. And I had to say to him, look, you know, you can't be selling that to, you know, to general public because they're going to be like, well, this is just a dish, but without the meat. You sort of mean you've got to, uh, so that was one example. Um, but yeah, absolutely. You look, you can be as ethical as possible. You can have the most ethical product in the world. It can be vegan, environmentally sustainable, you know, ticks all those boxes, ethical labor practices like the best. But if it's food and it doesn't taste good, people are not going to eat it. Like I say, I didn't, I was lucky. I found one vegan cheese and one chocolate that I liked back in the, you know, the mid nineties. But now there is so much choice. And, and I'm vegan and even I won't eat you know stuff that I if it doesn't taste nice just on fashion I've been banging on my, my drum about this for me there's nowhere near enough bling sparkle glitter and sequins in vegan fashion it annoys the hell out of me so will I go to I mean look I get most of my like stuff like this, I will mostly get these from vintage stores but I'll be perfectly honest if I can't find something like if I, I, I like and I want a sparkly jacket you know if a store has got it as long as it's not leather or you sweat or any animal product of course Will I go and buy it from that store or will I buy a bland beige from a vegan store? No, I won't. Um, and, you know, and that's me as a vegan. So obviously, you know, people who, who aren't yet vegan, uh, you've got to get them in. The, the taste or the look, the quality, all of that has got to be there. And it's almost like the vegan stuff, the ethics and stuff. It's a nice bonus in in a way. Um, I think we've, we we can't kid ourselves that, yes, our stories are important. And for those people who are our conscious consumers, of course, they're going to be looking for those things. But at the end of the day, if the product's no good, doesn't matter how great it is ethically, they're not going to come back. They're not going to buy it. So that's a really important 
point, David. So, Katrina, uh, you know, thank you so much. This has been a wonderful series of interviews with with Matthew, Niger, uh, Vikas, Adrian, Anik, Jeff. Have I forgotten anyone there? But you can view them all. No, I think that's now, all. <laughs> oh, wonderful. But well, you can view them uh, uh, now exclusively on our Vegan Business Academy on the Vegan Business Tribe website. And just to give the last word back to you, Katrina, you know, have you got any last closing points that you'd like to leave us about what you've learned about using your business of activism from this service? One thing I really want to say about this, because I've seen this discussed and I, I I heard it when I first wrote Vegan Ventures, my book, back way back in 2015, I actually had someone who's vegan, quite prominent, actually say to me, um, oh, why are you focusing on business instead of activism? And I was like, what? How dare you? How very dare you? Um, and, and I think that's really important is that this often comes up that there are so many different ways to do activism. And running a business, a vegan business, is definitely a form of activism. And I think sometimes within social justice movements, we can get a bit caught up. I've seen it happen in the LGBTIQ space, the feminist space, you know, since the early 80s, early to mid 80s. Um, we often get fight amongst ourselves and we infight and whereas people who are the the enemy you know or people who are oppressing people animals and planet tend to be able to put their differences aside and come together and i think we need to do more of that so i think rather than critiquing each other and saying oh your form of activism isn't as good as mine we need to let that go because running a business a vegan business is definitely a form of activism so if anyone tells you oh you're not a proper act activist because you're running a vegan business you can tell them to sod off and you can tell them katrina told you to sod off <laughs> What a wonderful no, place to end the interview. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Katrina. That's absolutely brilliant. So if you, you you heard it here first, Katrina Fox has given you permission to tell people to sod off. So if you haven't yet watched the interviews already, then it's time to go to the Vegan Business Tribe website and dive in. So thank you, Katrina, and thank you to all of our amazing vegan business activists. Thanks, David. Well, that was brilliant. And after we finished recording just then... I said to Katrina how much I love interviewing her because I don't have to do anything. I just give her a question and away she goes with all this information and all this insight, which just makes it really easy for me as an interviewer. I'm sure you can understand. But as I said, Katrina Fox, she is one of our experts over on Vegan Business Tribe and she is always willing and available to answer a question in our community hub. So, if you want to be part of our amazing vegan business community, then do head over to the website at veganbusinesstribe.com because not only will you get such amazing support and the help you need to grow a vegan business, but your membership, it also means that we can keep producing amazing content like our new series, which is going to help hundreds if not thousands of vegan businesses around the world. So that is it for this episode. Do head over to the website to get full access to all the interviews that we've been discussing today. And I'll see you on the next one. (laughs) 